Tennessee Life is sponsored by Mid South Sewing and Fabric has what you need for your creative adventure. If it's sewing, embroidery, or vinyl projects you need for a home business, Etsy, Pinterest, and your family, we have it. Mid South Sewing sells Brothers Sewing and Embroidery Machines and the latest Scan and Cut Crafting Machine. Mid South Sewing and Fabric in the Gallery Shopping Center. Tennessee Life is also brought to you by The Flower Pot. For over 100 years, offering flowers and same-day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations, KnoxvilleFlowerPot.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you. On this episode of Tennessee Life, we learn about the spooky side of the volunteer state from folks who search for ghosts. We start in Tennessee's oldest town, Jonesboro, where the spirits come out of the pages of history. When Andrew Jackson died, he didn't die in Jonesboro, Tennessee. He died in his hometown, Hermitage, Tennessee. But his spirit still has a strong effect. I guess there's something that pulls him there. Maybe it's a residual type haunting. East Tennessee Ghost Seekers is a group of investigators who try to document unexplained events and provide answers to people who have unwanted guests in their home. In my opinion, I think some spirits want to be found. There's some spirits that have that unfinished business, that have that last message they want to get to a loved one. We've caught voices of family members that just want to say goodbye, that never had that chance to say goodbye. I don't think all spirits are mean. All spirits don't have that malicious intent. There are some that do and we've come in contact with those. I mean, those aren't your everyday hauntings. The majority of the stuff that we get is the footsteps. And I think they're just going about their normal daily business as if they were still here. They're not wanting to hurt you. They don't want you to mess with them. We document that evidence and put it out there and we let everybody be the judge. Those stories next on this haunted edition of Tennessee Life. Thanks for joining us for this scary edition of Tennessee Life. I'm Vicki Lawson. On this episode, we're learning about a few of Tennessee's haunted legends. Some of these tales come from our state's oldest and most haunted town, Jonesboro. Ghost investigator Rob Phillips lives there and tells us about its legends. Tell me about Jonesboro, where you are from. Is it famous for being a haunted place? Jonesboro is very famous for being haunted. It's one of the most top 10 haunted towns in America. It was found in 1779 by Willie Jones. Man had never stepped foot into Jonesboro, but he was a, a supporter of the area. It used to be part of North Carolina. And then of course we went through that transition to where it was going to be the state of Franklin, which lasted, I think, what, maybe four years, if that. And it never really took well. And it ended up becoming Tennessee. I've, I've seen a lot of different spirits and things there that I can't explain. And I just want everybody else to experience it. I want people to come in and experience these things. And, and they want to because we get calls all the time of people wanting to know more about it and where can we experience one of these ghosts at? Well, just hang out one or two o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the evening, you never know. My nephew one day, we were in our office when we were located across from the Christopher Taylor cabin and this is the cabin where Andrew Jackson would come in and out of. He was sitting on the bench and I had walked inside and when I came out maybe a minute later, he said, and he was like 28, 29 years old at the time, he said, hey, Rob, let's, let's go over there and go into the Christopher Taylor cabin, which is a 1777 structure. He stayed there in 1788 and 1789 with one of his judge friends, Christopher Taylor's wife, Christopher Taylor, and their 13 children in a two-bedroom cabin while Andrew Jackson practiced law. Then he became judge later. I said, but we can't go in there. It's locked up. He said, no, it's not. He said, that guy just came out of it. I said, uh, what guy? He said, there was a guy, just came out of the cabin, let's go in. 
I said, we can't. I, I promise you, it's going to be locked. And I said, come on, I'll show you. Well, when we walked over there, it was locked, and it was locked from the inside. He said, Rob, there is no way. He said, I'm telling you, I saw that man come out of that cabin and walk down towards the Chester Inn. I said, well, what, what was he wearing? He said, well, black waiter boots, white pants, black cape. He said, maybe it looked like he was dressed for a costume party or something. He had gray hair, a black hat. I said, he looked like the man on a $20 bill. He said he resembled him a whole lot. I believe he saw Andrew Jackson, but it was on the opposite side of the street. Everything that's been reported of being seen there and everything that I have seen has always been on the opposite side of the road. When Andrew Jackson died, he didn't die in Jonesboro, Tennessee. He died in his hometown Hermitage. But his spirit still has a strong effect. I guess there's something that pulls him there. Maybe it's a residual type haunting. He has been seen in the courthouse of Jonesboro, and he has also been seen and this is the one that I'm trying to capture. I've, been, I've, I've heard the footsteps of the horse. I've heard the hoofs of the horse. And I tried to tell everybody, I'm, I'm hearing these things. So I went inside to tell them. And they're like, oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. Well, when I came back out, it, they were gone. Well, the next day, we find out that a woman that works in the store next door had actually seen this that night. And what it was was Andrew Jackson has been known, and this is what she's seen, to ride a white horse down Main Street from the Chester Inn to the town theater. He goes into the alley and he vanishes. He's on a white horse, he has black waiter boots, white pants, a black cape, and a top hat. And what's the fascinating about it, they say, is the horse doesn't have any legs. It's just like it's levitated off of the ground, it's just the chest up, Andrew Jackson's on the horse, and where the chest area is, it's just a smoky mist. And you can hear the, the horse running on the street as it goes. And, and I believe that's what I heard that night. If I hadn't went back inside to tell everybody what I was hearing, I probably would have heard it. Or, I'm sorry, saw that. But Andrew Jackson is one of the most popular ghosts of Jonesboro. He is one of the reasons that Jonesboro is on the map from one of the most haunted places. Cholera, uh, 1874, cholera hit Jonesboro. And it had a, hit at a time that Jonesboro was at a growth. Uh, new businesses were coming in, and all the construction had to stop just so the healthy could take care of the victims of the cholera. They kind of give you an idea that they said that it wiped out a third of the town's population, even though a lot of people from Jonesboro fled north to avoid the disease, it still wiped out a third. I would love to share a story with you of why this town is haunted. Please do. One, one of the reasons, I mean, I could go on for hours on this story. There was a man there by the name of Russell Bean. He was the first man born in what is now called Tennessee. This was in 1777 when he was born there. Around 1793, Russell grew up, became a man. They made a rifle, Russell and his family, called the Bean Rifle. It's a very, very well-made gun, and it's sought out by a lot of gun collectors to this day. Russell lived in a little cabin on Main Street, which used to be Stage Road, I think the name of it was. Lived in that cabin with his wife and two children. And Russell's sole means of living was to get a, a wagon load of guns made and take them to New Orleans and sell these guns. Well. Nobody in town really cared for Russell because Russell was more of a little redneck grunt guy. But he was a real husky fella, a real big guy. He just intimidated everybody. Well, one day, Russell decides, well, it's time to go to New Orleans to sell a load of these guns. But they didn't tell anybody that he was going. He didn't tell his wife. He didn't tell nobody in town. He just up and left to New Orleans where he stayed for two years. Everybody in the town thought he was dead. His wife just assumed somebody killed him because nobody liked the poor guy anyway. Two years later, Russell Bean decides, well, after he's been probably at the brothels and the saloons up there, well, I guess it's time I, I better go home. So he heads back to Tennessee and he walks into this cabin and he finds his wife nursing another man's child. 
it didn't sit well with Russell. Russell just became outraged. He left the cabin, went to the first saloon that he could find. He got a bottle of whiskey, drank as much as he could. A couple hours later, he staggered back up the dirt road to his cabin. He grabbed the baby out of the bed, pulled the knife out of his pocket, and he tried to cause harm to the baby. And then Russell was charged for and arrested for trying to cause baby's harm and was arrested for child abuse. So Russell was sent to jail and he escaped. And while he escaped, he was trying to find the man who got his wife pregnant. And Russell found out that the man that got his wife pregnant was a local merchant by the name of Alan. Well, Alan got word that Russell was looking for him and he went into hiding. Well, Russell couldn't find Alan nowhere, but he found Alan's brother on the street one day and he beat him mercifully just as a message to send to his brother Alan to what's going to happen to him when he finds him. Well, the word gets back to the sheriff what happened and the sheriff's starting to panic. I don't know how to get him back to jail. I don't know what to do. We can't bring him in. He's, he's shooting at people. He's beating people up. So he decides to take a bounty out, make him wanted, reward, dead or alive. So he goes to the new judge of Jonesboro, which is none other than Andrew Jackson himself, O. Hickory, the seventh president of the United States. So the new judge, Andrew Jackson, they tell him what's going on. Andrew Jackson just said, then go get him, bring him to me. And they're like, well, that's the problem. We can't. And we're afraid to, basically. Andrew Jackson stood up. He marched out of the courthouse. He had his pistol on his side. He walked straight up the dirt path to Russell Bean's home. He got on Russell Bean's property. Russell Bean pulled that rifle up and pointed it right at Andrew Jackson's head. Andrew Jackson didn't twitch. He pulled that pistol out of his pocket. He put his finger on the trigger, his thumb on the hammer, he cocked it back, and he pointed his pistol at Russell Bean's head. Russell Bean didn't know what to do. He panicked, threw his rifle down, jumped on the ground, and surrendered right then. Now, locals say that they see a man walking down the area of Main Street where his cabin used to be that fits the description of Russell Bean, and he'll turn the corner and disappear and they believe that it's Russell Bean and he's still searching for Alan. So that's different reasons that Jonesboro, just some of the reasons that Jonesboro is one of the top 10 most haunted towns in America. Why do you think people like hearing these stories about Jonesboro? What is it that people just want to know more about haunted places? People are intrigued by, by hauntings. You know, 20 years ago, if you mentioned a ghost, then you were the laughing stock of town. You were just bad people. But now with all the hype of things going on and people coming forward with things that's actually going on with these spirits and trying to figure out why, I think people have a bigger interest in it. As far as with Jonesboro, it being the oldest town in Tennessee, the history and it being known to be very haunted, which I'm hoping a lot more people know now that it's one of the top 10 most haunted towns in America. It kind of goes hand in hand with the history and the ghost and that people want to know more of the ghost that's down there and more of the history that's down there. Rob Phillips, thank you for You're sharing these historic haunted stories with us. You all have to come down and let me give you all a tour of Jonesboro. There's so much more I could give you. We will. Next, we join investigators from East Tennessee Ghost Seekers. Do you want to be inside these old train cars after dark? Sometimes unexplained events are what lead people to search out ghosts. The group called East Tennessee Ghost Seekers say when they get a call for help, they look for what can be explained logically. As you'll see, sometimes they can't. They show us what they've discovered during some of their investigations. Is anybody in here with us? If there's anything you want to say, all you have to do is talk into this little device. We're at the Southern Railway Station in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, this location, I've talked with some of the employees here and they've heard footsteps, 
They've seen men walking by the windows on these train cars that are next to us. A lot of the employees don't like closing the place down at night by themselves. They say that they'll go in, and they'll lock up doors, come back down the hall, they'll stop moving, and hear someone continue to come up behind them. Uh, they've heard voices, children, women, quite a bit of activity in this area. When we were standing outside the car, we were using our SLS camera. It's a tablet with a Xbox Connect camera connected to it with a special software. And as you're filming, it's shooting off infrared beams. It'll map out a person or a figure in a stick figure. And we were shining it at the wheel chassis of the train, and we had a stick figure appear. Are you it working seemed on the like train? it was working on the braking system or the wheels of the train. It was pretty cool. To me, that shows me it's more of a residual type haunt. It's just like a tape recorder playing itself over and over again. It's the stone tape theory. You know, an event happens, you know, the steels and rocks and woods, you know, they can hold on to that energy. And when the elements are right, it can replay itself over and over again. When I hear stories like that, my next, my first thought is I got to get in touch with someone over that property so we can get in there. Everybody in the paranormal field, your goal is to document that one piece of evidence that sets you aside from the rest. I believe in paranormal activity from all the experiences I've had in the dozens and dozens of locations that I've investigated. Like I said, I started out thrill-seeking as a, a true skeptic, and I am a true believer to this day. That's why I originally started the group, was for families that are running into problems at home with paranormal activity, just to give them some peace of mind and put them at ease. Every team member has experienced paranormal growing up, and we found it just to help those families that are dealing with things they can't explain. We go in with our equipment and help try to give them an answer to what's going on. My first experience, I was seven years old. It was two weeks after my great-grandfather had passed away. I remember going to bed and laying down with my back to the door, and I felt someone sit down on my bed and thought it was one of my grandparents roll over and he was sitting there and he patted me on my leg three times. I look, he smiles, gets up and walks out of my room. I chase after him and no one was there. That led me to wanting to know more and wanting to go out and find out why they're still here. You know, what's keeping people hanging on? So that's what we do. And we try to get answers for families, you know, whether it be a family member that they had pass away or just something they move into a house and it's something new, you know, try to explain to them what's going on. In my opinion, I think some spirits want to be found. Uh, there's some spirits that have that unfinished business, if you want to put it that way, that have that last message they want to get to a loved one. We've caught voices of family members that just want to say goodbye, that never had that chance to say goodbye. We never charge for investigations. We are a nonprofit. We do this to help the family. We are not, we don't go by the ghost hunter because we're not just out thrill seeking. We do this to help people. We do a full on investigation. We do, we have audio running the entire time. We have video running all the time. We get research on those properties, be it a residential location or a business. We do our research on that property go back as far as we can. First we go in and we talk with the families and we find out what they're having go on in their house. We come in with our equipment. We do a baseline reading, which is EMF, which is electromagnetic frequency. It lets us know where there's, if there's any outlets or appliances in the house that are giving off this frequency that can mess with you mentally and physically because high EMF can make you vomit, it can make you see things, uh, give you nightmares. So we go through and we check that first. We're trying to debunk before we go in. We like to look at it as being skeptically open. We have to enter a house as a skeptic because we don't know what all's going on there and it may just be that EMF that's causing this to go on. So we'll check that. We set up our cameras. We get out all of our tools that we use. We use different tools, uh, spirit boxes, ovuluses, and it's all communication devices. 
Uh, we use EMF detectors, which are the electromagnetic frequency detectors. Uh, we have several different types of those. We have a K2 meter. And it uses just lights on the top of it that detect the energy and will light up showing the strength. I, I feel to be a good paranormal investigator, you have to be an excellent debunker. So that's our first thing we do when we go into a location is try to debunk anything that could cause them to think that something was going on when there actually isn't. The most common calls are footsteps, hearing someone talk, and seeing shadow figures. And a lot of those are in the bedroom area. A lot of times we go and there is legit something going on in those areas. We've caught the, the audio of those footsteps. We've got shadows, we've got light orbs. Brushy Mountain was an amazing investigation. Everybody in Tennessee knows the history of Brushy Mountain and James Earl Ray. Walking into that place, you get a feeling like you've never felt before. I mean, everybody looks at, at prisons and jails as this horrible place and that's what it is. You walk into this place and you get chills from your head to your toe, especially in the middle of the night, walking down these cell blocks. We caught voices, we got a guy laugh at us. We chased a guy and footsteps around in the auditorium for 45 minutes that night. I saw him in my face. My wife is behind me coming with a camera. And I'm going through a door and when I go through the door, he was standing right there. It's startling. I mean, that, there's no other way to put it. It's startling. Another place we've investigated is Hell's Bar Dam. Uh, Hell's Bar Dam is located in Guild, Tennessee. It's about 20 miles west of Chattanooga. TVA came in there to build this dam and it never did its job. They could never get it to seal. It was constantly leaking and TVA was losing more money than they were ever gonna profit from it. So they built another dam to take its place and they destroyed Hell's Bar Dam. The main pump house and one of the other outbuildings is still there. They're connected by an underground tunnel system. That place we caught our best piece of evidence to date. We got a full body apparition of a young girl. I'm assuming between eight and 10 years old. We go into the third floor, building two. We get to the top of the stairs. We pan around with a camera and then come back around in that pan. She's standing at the end of that hall, looking straight at us and turns to her left and walks away. That in the paranormal field is, the, is what everyone goes looking for. I don't know how to explain that away. I don't, I, I don't know what to take from that other than that was something residual that you know, we were there again at that perfect point in time. There are a lot of strange things happening in the state, you know, from Chattanooga to La Follette, I mean, and as far west as Memphis, you know, anywhere you go, there's going to be some activity just from the history of the state itself, you know, from the Civil War, you know, and just odd, odd occurrences with, you know, murders and suicides, you know, it's just the whole gamut. One point I want to make real quick, uh, people always ask, why do we investigate at night? Is it because it's creepier? No, it's because it's quieter. At night, people are sleeping. You don't have all the traffic out on the highways, the background noises. That's why we investigate at night. The greatest tool you have in an investigation is yourself. When you walk into a location and you get those chills and the hair stands up on your arm, you don't get that in every place you go into. You can walk into certain rooms and you'll feel that. It'll feel like you walk through cobwebs and there's no cobwebs there. That's hard to, it's hard to explain, that even to the skeptic, walking through that room and walking through that cobweb that isn't there. We take a lot of skeptics out with us on our investigations for the public events. And that's usually the thing that pulls them over to the paranormal side. When they feel that cobweb, that brush on the leg, the touch on the arm, uh, or in some cases, even being scratched. Skeptics are, are our best friends and our worst enemies at the same time. Um, because when once we do show them that piece of evidence and they're like, okay, yeah, we've done our job of 
pulling that person over. But then you have the ones on the other spectrum that is like, it doesn't matter what you show me, I'm not going to believe it. And, you know, to each their own. I'm a believer. The team's a believer. There's several people out there that aren't believers. And if I can produce one piece of evidence to make one person go, okay, maybe this is legit. You know, I feel like I've done something, you know. I mean, we're there to help families and to prove this stuff is real. Whether you believe these stories are historic haunts or just tall tales, it's up to you. Feel free to take some of them to your next campfire. I'm Vicki Lawson. See you on the next Tennessee Life. Tennessee Life is sponsored by Mid-South Sewing and Fabric has what you need for your creative adventure. If it's sewing, embroidery, or vinyl projects you need for a home business, Etsy, Pinterest, and your family, we have it. Mid-South Sewing sells Brothers Sewing and Embroidery Machines and the latest Scan and Cut Crafting Machine. Mid-South Sewing and Fabric in the Gallery Shopping Center. Tennessee Life is also brought to you by The Flower Pot. For over 100 years, offering flowers and same-day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations, knoxvilleflowerpot.com. And by viewers like you, thank you.